Uh, let me begin by thanking Kumar for his kind invitation to speak in the Fields Institute Number Theory Seminar Series. Uh, this is going to be the prep talk for the upcoming talk on May 20, 2020, uh, that's titled The Circle Method and Subconvexity Problem. In today's talk, I'm just going to describe the basic tools which I use uh, in proving subconvex bounds. And I'm going to uh, give two different proofs of a particular subconvexity problem. So let's start uh, with the very basic arithmetic problem where uh, in most analytic number theory problem, it boils down to estimating certain sums. And uh, this is what we usually encounter. So this is an arithmetic function, n going to n. So you can think of it as a sequence. And we're looking at the summatory function, ax equals to sum of n. Okay, a basic example, is you start with a primitive, Dirichlet, a primitive character of this group Z modulo QZ star, and uh, you define a Dirichlet character out of it. Uh, it's a function defined over all integers in the following fashion. You define chi n to be n, uh, chi of the value of n modulo Q if n and Q are co-prime, and chi n to be zero if n is not co-prime with Q. Then uh, if you look at the symmetry function for this uh, arithmetic function chi n, then there is a uh, well-known result due to polya Vinogradov, which says that the symmetry function cannot be more than, uh, the absolute value of that cannot be more than six times square root of Q log Q, okay? And the nice thing about this is that bound on the right-hand side is independent of the original length of the sum, which is X. And uh, the bad thing is that if the length of the sum is quite small, say if it is smaller than square root of Q, then the bound is actually trivial or even worse, okay? And uh, in the subconvexity problem, uh, we'll encounter short sums where the, best, the main problem will be showing that there is cancellation, still cancellation in this type of sums when the length of the sum is much shorter than square root of Q, okay? And this was uh, tackled by Burgess. Uh, we can also look at uh, a smooth version of the problem. So in the previous slide, we were looking at uh, a sharp chord in that arithmetic sequence. Now we have a smooth weight function. And in, in the case of some convexity problem, it usually comes with a smooth weight function. So omega is uh, a bump function. You can think of it as supported between one and two and with its derivative not uh, bounded by all derivatives, bounded by one, like that. Okay, so this is uh, sum of n, uh, uh, w of n by x. So the sum, as if w is supported between one and two, the sum is supported between x and two x. So you can think of it as more or less a smooth version of the sum we had in the previous slide, that is ax. And there is a relation by partial summation, we can get rid of the wet and we can write down this smooth version in terms of the sharp curve, the following one. Okay, so that means if we have an estimate of the sum in the case of a sharp curve, then we can recover some estimate for the smooth version also. But the other direction is not uh, really true that if you have a good bound for the smooth sum, you may not have a good bound for the sharp curve. Uh, one basic tool in estimating sums of this type is uh, the Poisson summation formula. And let us recall what it says. So if you have a function f, says that, uh, which is in L1, and suppose its Fourier transform is also in L1 and both of them are uh, bounded variation, then we have uh, the sum of Fn is same as the sum of the Fourier transform Fn. And let us look at some applications of the Poisson summation formula. Uh, suppose we are looking at this summatory function, sum of chi n, but if the smooth weight F, and again, think of F as a bump function supported between one and two, and now uh, splitting n into congruence classes modulo q, we can write this sum as this because chi n is periodic modulo q. So it, uh, we should, should have chi a over here, not chi q. And uh, again, here I should have chi a. And then uh, I applied the Poisson summation formula right over here. The sum is over all integers here, and then it becomes a sum over all Fourier transforms of the integer values. And uh, then by a change of variable, it basically reduces to this particular sum, okay? So the Poisson summation formula transforms this symmetry function 
to a summatory function of chi bar uh, with a weight which is the Fourier transform of the previous weight. Okay. And then there is some uh, uh, n by q g chi, where g chi is the Gauss sum corresponding to the character chi. Here I'm using EZ, uh, EZ is e to the power two pi z, which is a standard notation in a number theory. Okay, so uh, this is one uh, application, a uh, simple application of the Poisson summation formula. And now what can we derive from that? So this is again the same formula. Uh, at least if you look at the right hand side, we know that the Gauss sum is bounded by square root of the modulus. So that the Gauss sum is a complete character sum, modulo Q, and we know that it's bounded by square root of Q. So there is a full square root cancellation in the Gauss sum. We also know that if we have a bump function, the Fourier transform of it uh, decays rapidly. So once it crosses like uh, Q to the power epsilon, uh, then all the Fourier transforms are negatively small. Okay. So that somehow gives you the support of uh, this right hand side of this formula. Okay, and uh, using these two information, we can estimate the right hand side and it turns out that this is bounded by this. So we can cut the length of the sum at Q by N using the bound for F at Y uh, at the cost of a negligible error term. And so if we get that this is the sum, original sum is bounded by Q to the power half plus epsilon, which is uh, reminiscent of the polyalbin of the bound. Okay. Now, uh, so let's see what we have done. So initially we have this sum of length capital N and now it has become, uh, and the bound that we're getting is square root of Q. So trivially the initial sum had bound N and now we have square root of Q. So we have a saving of N by square root of Q, which you can think of as same as uh, the length of the initial sum, which was N by square root of the modulus. Uh, modulus was the uh, modulus of the character chi. And this is also same as square root of the initial length by final. Okay, so when you use the Poisson summation formula, this is the saving that you expect to get from the Poisson summation formula, square root of the initial length by square root of the final length. And we'll see that when you go to higher dimensional analogs of Poisson summation formula, the so-called Voronoi summation formula, we still have this, that the that saving that we get by applying the Voronoi summation formula is still square root of the initial length by square root of the Okay, so another application of the Poisson summation formula is, uh, is functional equation for Dirichlet function. So let's re recall the Dirichlet function uh, LS chi corresponding to the character chi is given by this uh, L series chi n by n to the power s. This is also given by this Euler product. Uh, this is just the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and the multiplicativity of the character chi n. And both the series and the product converge absolutely uh, if in the real part of S greater than one, in that right half plane. And we then have an integral representation where we can write this LS chi as an integral of some theta function, and that gives you an analytic continuation and shows that this uh, L function is entire, except when um, you were looking at the trivial uh, character, which happens when Q equals to one. And in which case you have the Riemann jeta function, and the Riemann jeta function has a simple pole that is equals to one. In, in all other cases, there are no poles. All these uh, functions are going to be entire. An application of Poisson here is, uh, so as I said, that LS chi can be written as an integral of a theta function. And the Poisson summation formula gives you a relation, a summation formula for the theta function, uh, or a transformation formula a function and that can be used to de derive a functional equation for this uh, Dirichlet function, which uh, can be written in this way. So first you complete the Dirichlet function by multiplying our gamma factor and Q pi to the power s by two. This kappa is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the parity of the character. So if it's given, then it's zero. If it's odd, then kappa is one. And then we have this nice functional equation that the value of the complete real function at S is same as the value at one minus S of chi bar, the complete real function of chi bar, with a root number, which is I to the power kappa times epsilon chi, where epsilon chi is the, uh, the sign of the Gauss sum. So it's Gauss sum by square root of Q. 
Okay, so there, and these are some of the basic applications of uh, the uh, Poisson summation form. Next, I want to say that the, the initial summatory function uh, that we had is related to this L function, and the, a nice formula which relates uh, them uh, is uh, due to Perron, and uh, where it says that uh, AX can be written as an integral of LS chi. So AX here is the summatory function for chi n. And so it follows from here that if you want to estimate uh, the size of X, you can uh, try to estimate LS chi, okay? So uh, here the C has to be in uh, the region where LS chi converges absolutely. But once you have this integral, then you can shift the contour to the left. And uh, by shifting the contour to C equals to zero, using the functional equation and a little more work, we can recover the poly weather bound for the case. Okay. Now, uh, the subconvexity problem is about getting bounds for L functions of this type, LS chi. Okay. LS chi is an example of a degree one L function. And we'll later tell you about the higher degree L functions also. The, the convexity bound. Uh, uh, Okay, so let me, uh, yeah, so we are looking for uh, to get bounds of L half plus IIT chi. So first of all, it's enough to bound the L function on the central line. So the functional equation relates the value at S to one minus S. And so we, are, uh, we have this critical strip uh, where the real part of S is between zero and one. And, uh, uh, and we have the convexity principle. And it's uh, from that we derive that uh, if we get a bound for the L function on the central line, we can get a bound for the L function at anywhere else. Okay, so it's enough to bound the L function on the central line. So L half plus IIT chi, that's what we're looking at. And we want to uh, bound it as uh, a power of T, so T to the power alpha, and the power of the modulus, Q to the power beta. Okay. And by the fragment lindel of convexity principle, the functional equation, which is Poisson summation, we can uh, sh we can show that we can take alpha and beta to be one quarter. But the Riemann hypothesis, which is expected to be true in this case, implies the Lindelof hypothesis, which allows our, us to take alpha beta to be arbitrarily small positive number, epsilon. Okay. And the subconvexity problem in this case asks to uh, produce a bound of this form where uh, if you are interested in the T aspects of convexity, then you are trying to get alpha exponent over here to be less than one quarter. And if you're uh, interested in level aspects of convexity, then you are trying to get a beta less than one quarter. Okay, and uh, one way of uh, proving subconvexity uh, is by using what's called an approximate functional equation. And uh, this is uh, an, uh, a consequence of the functional equation, and uh, that gives you an expression of the L function inside the critical strip. In particular, for the Dirichlet L function, we can write L half plus IIT chi as a sum of two uh, terms, where each, uh, the first term looks like this. So it's like the partial sum of the uh, L function that we had, chi n by n to the power half plus IIT, where n is going up to square root of tq. So here I'm taking t to be larger than two. Uh, so we don't have to write one plus epsilon t or anything. And, uh, and the n, the length of the sum goes up to square root of t times q. Here t times q is the conductor of the L function. So this, the length of the sum is square root of the conductor. And it, it comes with also a dual part where we have to look at the L function of chi bar. Okay, so this is the, partial sum for the L function of chi bar at half plus minus i t. And here also the n goes up to square root of tq. So we get, uh, we can express L half plus i t chi as a sum of two terms where both of them have the same length square root of tq. And here eta is going to be something of absolute value one. Okay, now if you estimate this sums trivially, then you get the convexity bound. Uh, so to obtain the subconvex bound, you need to show that there is cancellation in this type of sums. Now, if you are interested in the T aspects of convexity, then you want to show there is cancellation in this sum into the power IT. So here your Q is fixed. And so N is going up to square root of T. So you can take Q to be one, for example, say you're looking at the Riemann-Jeta function. 
then you are looking at the sum of n to the power i t where n goes up to square root t. And if you're interested in the level aspect of the q aspect, say t equals to zero in that case, you're looking at the central value, then n is going up to square root of q and pi n. Okay. And uh, in either case, if you apply the Poisson summation formula, and if you use that, uh, the kitchen philosophy that I mentioned that the saving that from Poisson that you get is the initial length by the modulus, square root of the modulus, you'll see that in both cases, the saving is one. So there is no saving at all, okay? So, and uh, also you'll see that the sum that you have over here is just uh, uh, beyond the threshold of the fully Avinogradov bound. So the fully Avinogradov doesn't give you any a non-trivial bound for such sums. Okay. Nevertheless, uh, subconvex bounds in these cases were proved long back, uh, first by Herman Weil and Hardy Littlewood, and they proved the T aspect and uh, bound was due to power one six plus epsilon. And then uh, in around 1960s, uh, Burgess proved the level aspect where he got Q to the power three by sixteen. I'm not going to prove this or I'll tell you much about the proof. These are standard are uh, quite uh, well known. Uh, so now let me move towards what are uh, called the higher rank arithmetic functions. So, so far we have been uh, looking at arithmetic functions such that n going to n to the power i t in case of jeta, or n going to chi n in case of ls chi if you're looking at the central point or n going to chi n into the power i t. So if you're looking at uh, the L function and, uh, and some point uh, far away from the center, okay? And if you look at these functions, this is uh, quite simple. That, uh, for example, n to the power i t is uh, it's really a kind of an analytic function. There's not much arithmetic involved in there. Chi n involves uh, some arithmetic, but chi n is completely multiplicative. And it's also periodic, and uh, so some, there is some way to explicitly write them down. But there are arithmetic functions which arise naturally in number theory and elsewhere, like representation theory, which are not completely multiplicative, but satisfy recurrence relations. For example, uh, so lambda p to the j plus one is not really lambda p times lambda p to the power j, but it comes uh, minus lambda p to the power j minus. One. So if you know the value at p to the power j and p to the power j minus one, you get the value of p to the power j plus one. Uh, so this is a degree two recurrence relation, or you may have a degree three recurrence relation like this. So where uh, the value at j plus one, j and j minus one determine the value at j plus two. Okay. So such uh, sequences arise when you look at the normalized Fourier coefficients of Hecke eigenforms of higher rank groups. Uh, we say and uh, we satisfied uh, the Hecke relations. These are the Hecke relations, basically. Okay, so one simple example of a function which satisfies the degree two recurrence relation uh, is the divisor function. And if you look at the Dirichlet series uh, corresponding to the divisor function, that comes out to be the square of the Riemann jeta function. So this is like a uh, the, the Wheeler product here is of degree two. So it's a higher rank L function, but it's made of uh, the uh, low, lower rank L function. So in fact, uh, this, uh, the divisive functions are the coefficients of the Eisenstein series. Okay, so this is a non cuspidal form. Uh, so we can write uh, down explicitly the, the, the Fourier coefficients of the Eisenstein series, and they can be written in terms of the divisive function. But there are uh, cuspidal modular forms, and the Fourier coefficients of cuspidal modular forms are much more mysterious. There is uh, no uh, way to write them down completely. Uh, we know that they are multiplicative, and uh, we know that they satisfy a degree two recurrence relation. And that's more or less what we know. Um, so here is one uh, explicit example of a modular form as the discriminant modular form so here q is ez or e to the power 2 by z and z is a point of the upper half plane and the modular form delta z is defined by this product and if you uh, expand it and then you get some uh, new function tau n so this is the arithmetic function that we are interested in this is called the ramanujan tau function 
And the nice thing about this function delta is that it satisfies a transformation property that the, del the value of delta at a z plus b by c z plus d is this, where a, b, c, d is a matrix in SL to z. So it, it satisfies a certain relation with respect to transformations coming from SL to z. Or in other words, delta is a modular form. It's actually a cusp form of weight 12 and level one. And Ramanujan was interested in this tau function, which is the Fourier coefficient of the discriminant modular form. And uh, suppose we normalize uh, by dividing the Fourier uh, a tau n by n to the power 11 by 2, let's call it tau naught n, then uh, Ramanujan actually conjectured and later was proved that uh, they are multiplicative. Tau naught mn is tau naught mn tau if n and n are co prime. And tau naught p to the power plus one satisfy recurrence relation. And Ramanujan further conjectured that tau naught p should be, the absolute value of that should be less than two. And uh, this is um, much harder than the other two. Okay, but all of them are now known to be true. And the Hecke L function or the L function related uh, to the discriminant from delta is defined in this way, L s delta is sum of tau naught n by n to the power s. And the, using this relation, the recurrence relation and the multiplicativity property, we can write this as a Wohler product, right? And you can see there's a degree two Wohler product. So there is a factor of one by p to the power two s. So you can factorize this. There'll be two factor for the prime p. So it's a degree two Wohler product. And uh, we can show, one can show that it's absolutely converging both the product and the series in the uh, right half plane real part of is larger than one. And it extends to an enter function and it satisfies a functional equation. Okay. You can uh, compare this with the functional equation we had for the Dirichlet function. It's slightly different. If you look at the gamma factor there, we had an S by two, now we have an S. So this is a degree two uh, functional equation. So we are now again interested in understanding the symmetric function is the sum of the Fourier coefficients lambda n, or suppose it's lambda n twisted by n to the power i t, or lambda n twisted by uh, the Dirichlet character chi n. But uh, we do not have a Poisson summation formula. But there is an analog of the Poisson summation formula that's called the Voronoi summation formula, which is slightly computed, complicated compared to the Poisson summation formula. So again, uh, so we have lambda n and um, uh, suppose we we'll twist lambda n by an additive character e n by q. So I'm taking a and q to be co prime. And um, then, and then again, w is a weight function as before, bump function. And then this is equal to this, okay, the right hand side. You will see that a here has become minus a bar, where a bar is the multiplicative inverse of a modulo q. And the uh, Instead of Fourier transform, we have a Henkel transform, which is uh, uh, we have to multiply with a suitable J Bessel function. It's a J Bessel function of uh, order k minus one, where k is the weight of the modular form whose Fourier coefficients are lambda n. Okay. So, so we still have a summation formula, and uh, and this such such formula. This is I'm uh, writing it down for uh, level one, but you have a similar formula for any general level, you may have even tippers, or it, it, similar result that uh, formulas are also there for mass forms. Okay, so now uh, let's see how much can we save using the Voronoi summation formula. Okay, so if you uh, look at this, so we have to study the Henkel transform first. So the Bessel function, so if k is fixed, the k is 12, so suppose we're looking at the Ramanujan delta function, then the J Bessel function is more or less uh, like ex by square root of x. And it follows, so if you look at this, all right, so if this guy is larger than q to the power epsilon, then it is oscillating like e of two root n n x by q. So by uh, integrating by parts, a million times, you can show that it's negligibly small. So it follows that the Henkel transform is negligibly small if n is larger than Q squared by capital N, where Q was the modulus of the arithmetic uh, of the additive character, 
and capital N was the initial length. So from Voronoi, we have that uh, this sum is uh, equal to N by Q plus th times this sum, where now the dual length is square of the modulus by the initial length, and the A has become minus A bar. Okay. And if we assume that, that lambda Ns are bounded by N to the power epsilon, so this means the absolute value of lambda N is bounded by uh, some constant time into the power epsilon where epsilon is arbitrarily small. Then the left-hand side is trivially bounded by capital N or capital N to the power one plus epsilon. And the right-hand side is trivially bounded by Q, or Q to the power one plus epsilon. So uh, from N, we go down to Q, so we save N by Q. Okay, so that's the amount we're saving, which is same as N by square root of Q square. And what is uh, special about Q squared? Q squared is the conductor of uh, this sum. So imagine that if you replace uh, this additive character by chi n, where chi is a Dirichlet character modulo Q, primitive Dirichlet character modulo Q, then uh, this lambda twisted by chi is a modular form of level Q squared. So that's the conductor of this. So the saving is again in the initial length by square root of the conductor, and that is same as square root of the initial length by chi. So that's again how much you save by applying the Voronoi summation formula. Okay, so now uh, let's see some applications of the Voronoi summation formula. So this is uh, we're looking at lambda n chi n, say small n is of n capital n. So you can lambda take lambda to be the normalized Fourier coefficients of the discriminant form. It will and say chi is uh, a Dirichlet -like character modulo Q. And now from chi, uh, we move to the additive character using, uh, you know, introduce Gauss sum, so you can do that. And uh, then we use, here we use a uh, uh, Voronoi summation formula, so the capital N, the length N becomes Q squared by N. So the original sum reduces something to something like this. Where G chi is the Gauss sum for chi, G chi bar is a Gauss sum for chi bar. They are of same size, so both of uh, size root Q. And so it follows that the initial uh, sum had was bounded by capital N trivially. And the final sum here is bounded by N by Q times Q squared by N, that is Q. Okay, so that yields uh, an analog of the polia of Vinograd of that uh, the sum is bounded by Q by one plus epsilon. And this is a non-trivial bound as long as the length of the sum n is larger than q, or larger than square root of the conductor of the corresponding L function. Okay, and let's look at another a nice example of the applic uh, an application of the Voronoi summation formula. So take alpha, uh, a real number between zero and one, and consider the smooth sum, which is the Fourier coefficient lambda n twisted by e alpha n. And then you use a diophant and approximation. Dirichlet's theorem says that alpha can be written as a by q plus theta, where small q is less than or equal to capital Q, where capital Q is taken as square root of n, and then theta will be bounded by one by small q capital Q. That's the Dirichlet approximation theorem. And uh, now we look at this part of the sum, and suppose uh, our small q is generic, so the small q is roughly of size square root of n. And in that case, uh, this e theta n is not really oscillating, so it's almost like a flat function or a, a bump function, so you don't really need to worry about e theta n. So this ax is more or less like uh, lambda n e n q, and then again, if you use the Voronoi summation formula, it boils down to n by q and n going up to q squared by n and this. And again, if you use uh, the trivial bound here, you get q and q now is like square root of n. So you get that ax is bounded by square root of n. So in this uh, sum of Fourier coefficient twisted by additive character, we're able to show that these sums are always have square root cancellation. And uh, so you may ask what happens for smaller q. Now, when a q is small, this, this part starts oscillating, e theta n, but the arithmetic part, the modulus of the arithmetic part is smaller and that kind of balances the oscillation and uh, we still get the final modulus going.
okay okay so now i'm going to uh, tell you about the bro noise summation formula at higher rank and uh, and, and things get really complicated once you move beyond gl2 uh, so uh, i'm going to assume that you ha are somewhat familiar with uh, more automorphic forms on sl3z and i'm just going to write down the bro noise summation formula for sl3z so suppose A M N are the normalized Fourier coefficient of a Hecke mass cast form for SL3Z. And then uh, lambda N, and I take lambda N to be A1N, so I'm taking N to be one, okay? And then if you look at this sequence, this arithmetic function, this satisfies a recurrence formula of degree three, okay? Okay, and then there is a Voronoi formula and that takes the shape here. So I'm taking A1N to its band additive character as before. And now I'm writing the weight to be GN. Okay, and then uh, you have this. And here this S is the Klosterman sum. Okay, so it's a Klosterman sum modulo Q by N, where N here is a divisor of Q. So you can, you can take small N to be one, and then it will be a Klosterman sum modulo Q. Where Q was the modulus of the additive character. And the integral transform is a little more complicated. So there are two parts, with one with a plus and the other with a minus. And that those are given by uh, this integral, y to the power minus s, g tilde of minus s. G tilde is the uh, Millin transform of the weight g. And this gamma plus minus r can be expressed in terms of gamma naught and gamma one where gamma naught and gamma one are given by this ratio of gamma functions, where you have this alpha i's uh, in the gamma function, those are the Langlands parameter of the uh, mass form that you are working with. Okay, so slightly complicated, but nevertheless, you can uh, do certain simplification. In particular, if you are interested in finding out what's going out, uh, what is going on in terms of the parameter Q. So suppose um, uh, your form is more or less fixed and you have an additive character where small Q is really big and you want to see uh, what is the size of the right-hand side. Then uh, you can say a lot. So suppose now uh, the G is again a bump function. So the initial length is kept to N. And then if you look at the integral transform, uh, if you study it, then you'll see that it's negligibly small if the n there is larger than cube of q by n. So it's the q to the power three is actually the conductor of uh, this form twisted by a chi, where chi is the Dirichlet character multiple q. So it, you can think of it as the conductor of this sum. So you're saying that the integral transform is negligibly small if n is larger than uh, Q is conductor by the initial length, okay? And, and then uh, basically the Voronoi is saying that uh, A1n twisted by AnQ is AM1 uh, twisted by a Klosterman sum um, and uh, with this factor, okay? And now if you assume that A1ns are bounded by n to the power epsilon, basically the nominal conjecture, but if we assume that it's true on average, then the left-hand side is trivially bounded by capital N, and the right-hand side, if you assume the web bound, the web bound says that the close to mount sum is bounded by square root of Q, uh, then the, this part is bounded by Q to the power three by two, trivially, assuming the web bound. So we save uh, N by, so it was N, and this, is, this side is Q to the power three by two, so our saving is n by uh, q to the power three by two or n to the power n by square root of q to the power three. Okay, and q to the power three is the conductor. So uh, the saving that we get from Voronoi is initial length by square root of the conductor, which is again same as uh, the square root of the initial length by square root of the final length. So it's root n by root q cube by root n. Okay. And an application of this Voronoi summation formula is uh, this bound that uh, if you twist uh, the Fourier coefficient of uh, Fourier Whittaker coefficient of a SL3Z mass form by an additive character E alpha n, then it is bounded by n to the power three quarter. Okay. 
We expect that this will be bounded by into the power half, but uh, this is what we can get from the Volvo micro. In the case of GL2, you can actually show that it's bounded by into the power half, but that's quite uh, difficult in case of GL3. Anyway, so now let me tell you about the subconvexity problem in GL2. So suppose you are looking at the modular form F uh, of wet K and level M, and then if you look at the L function, so um, so the L function is defined in the same fashion as as, as I did for the discriminant uh, form delta. Um, so if you are looking at L half plus I T F, then there are three different parameters which are involved here. One is of course this T. The other two parameters are related to F, the level of F, that is M, and the weight of F, that is K. Okay. And so uh, the weight actually mingles with uh, the T part. And uh, if we are looking for bounds of this type, uh, absolute value of T plus K to the power two alpha and M to the power beta. Now we have a two over here because uh, the gamma, there are two, this is a degree two L functions. Okay. So there are two gamma factors. Um, so the, from the functional equation, we can again derive the convexity bound, which gives you a bound of this type with alpha and beta like one quarter. So this is what one can get from the functional equation of the corresponding L function and the fragment lindelof of principle. Uh, and uh, for subconvexity, what you want, if you are looking for T aspect or weight aspect subconvexity, then you want to make this alpha smaller than one quarter. And if you're interested in the level aspects of convexity, then you want to make this beta, the power of the level, to be less than one quarter, okay? And the first uh, such result in this direction was proved by Anton Good in 1980s. And he proved the T aspects of convexity. He reduced this from this alpha to one sixth. So this is the analog of the uh, while bound. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on a particular subconvexity problem. It's called, um, it's about, uh, uh, you know, you have a fixed form F, so you can fix it to be the discriminant form delta. And I'm going to twist it by a Dirichlet character chi uh, of modulus, uh, it's primitive Dirichlet character with modulus Q, so it's F. Uh, twisted by chi will be a Hecker form of level Q square. Okay, so F twisted by chi at Z, upper half plane, is given by this. So you're just taking the Fourier coefficient of F and twisted by chi n. And the convexity, so the level is Q square. So if you go to the previous slide, so you can get beta to be one quarter. So Q squared to the power one quarter is square root of Q. So the convexity bound is. Uh, this is bounded by Q to the power half plus epsilon. And uh, the subconvexity will be to uh, make something smaller, this be smaller than one half. Okay, so now I'm going to tell uh, you about two different methods of proving subconvexity in this way, uh, in, in this case. Uh, the first one, uh, this approach is due to uh, Friedlander advantage, and this was worked out, this particular case was worked out by Duke Friedlander advantage in 1990s. Okay, you start with the approximate functional equation, uh, which says that L half F twisted by chi can be uh, approximated by lambda n. So this is the normalized Fourier coefficients of F times chi n by square root of n. And the length of a, the n goes up to square root of the conductor, and the conductor was Q squared. So here the n goes up to Q. Okay. So to prove, we can get rid of root n by using partial summation. So the problem here boils down to getting cancellation in sums of the type lambda n chi n. Okay. And uh, again, if you go back to the polya vinograd uh, type of bound, you'll see that we are just beyond the range of the polya vinograd Okay, here, and for n equal to q, this uh, polya vinograd gives you the trivial bound. Okay, so you are, we are really trying to go beyond polya vinograd. So the moment method, um, in moment method, what you do is you take the sum that you want to estimate and you uh, compute the second moment over a certain family, okay? 
And uh, if you consider this uh, particular second moment where, uh, so you were interested in a particular character chi modulo q, and now you average over all characters psi modulo q. So chi is one of this size here. And you're looking at the second moment. And uh, uh, then if you have a bound for this uh, B, and then you can drop all the terms and return psi equals to chi over here. And then for that particular sum, you get the bound square root of B. So a bound for this sum gives you a bound for that particular uh, sum over lambda n chi n. But uh, in this case, the family is uh, too big because the best possible bound here uh, is you can not get more than square root cancellation. So that would be, uh, if you put square root of Q for this sum and square root of Q squared, that's Q times Q, that's Q squared. So the best possible bound for this is Q squared. But if you uh, bound this by Q squared, then the bound for the individual sum would be square root of Q squared, that will be Q. And that's uh, just convexity. That's the trivial bound for the sum. So you cannot just look at the amplified moment. So you have to look at the amplified second moment. And the amplification in this particular case is quite simple. So you multiply with this particular amplifier, psi L chi bar L. So you are looking at the contribution of the character chi in this sum, and you are amplifying the contribution of psi equals to chi. So in psi equals to chi, there's no cancellation in this sum, and this term is like L squared where psi is not equal to chi, you expect some cancellation here, probably square root cancellation in here, and this sum uh, will be like L instead of L square. So in this uh, amplified moment, you, your particular sum is, gets more weight compared to the other sums. So now we want to estimate this sum, and uh, uh, we open the absolute value squares, bring in the sum over psi inside, and now execute the sum over psi, and that gives rise to a congruence that L1, N1 is congruent to L2, N2 modulo Q. Okay, and so we arrived at this, and now at this point, if you estimate this sum trivially, then you get that this is bounded by QL square. Okay, and now if you uh, plug in this bound over here, that if you bound this by QL square, and uh, take now drop all the psi except psi equals to chi, then you can get the trivial bound for lambda and chi. Okay, so for subconvexity, what you need to show is a certain cancellation in this particular part, lambda n one, lambda n two, where q divides. Okay, so so we want to show there is cancellation in the sum uh, lambda n one, lambda n two, where n one l one minus n two l two is congruent to zero modulo q. Okay, and now the congruence we change the congruence into a uh, an equation by introducing a variable r. So n1, n2 are of size q, so that r will be at most of size cap to l. Okay, and uh, so, and now we have this equation and we take, detect this equation using the circle method. Okay. So this, this was the approach of Duke field learning. This is called the uh, shifted convolution sum problem. Okay, and Duke field learning advantage solve this using uh, the, the uh, version of the circle method that they formulated and called delta method. Okay, so what is circle method? So circle methods are like, or, uh, or the delta method is like a Fourier expansion of the Kronecker delta function. The Kronecker delta function is a function, arithmetic function taking value zero and one. It takes the value one for at n equals to zero and takes the value zero for n not equal. And the uh, delta method gives you a Fourier expansion for this um, uh, de uh, delta function. And here, your capital C is up to you to choose. And this function H can be written down explicitly. And it is a reasonably nice function in the sense that if you uh, pick your C to be square root of the size of the equation that you are detecting, then uh, this function, this H function part is more or less flat or not oscillating. Okay. Okay. So suppose, uh, so that's what I'm going to. Uh, yeah. So suppose we are detecting n equals to zero in the range minus n to n, 
Then by picking uh, your capital C to be square root of n, in the circle method or delta method, we can make the h part non-oscillatory. Okay. So now we use this formula over here. So you, we detect this. So we are going to detect delta of n1 l1 minus n2 l2 minus qr. And uh, we take capital C to be the square root of the size of the equation. The size, the, the variables involved in the equation are of size Q times L. So you take C to be square root of Q times L. And then the H part can be ignored. And uh, then you get that S is given by uh, this sum. Okay, so this is, these are the parts coming from the delta. The equation is gone and we have this additive character. Okay, N1, L1, L2, minus Q1. Okay, so now if you trivially estimate this sum, you get uh, Q squared L. Uh, that's okay because you know, when you are sacrificing the equation, then you're sacrificing the whole length of the equation, which is Q times L. Okay, so now our job will be to recover this loss of Q times L and to get, as say, more than Q times so now we have uh, separated at n1, n2, and, uh, okay, so they're kind of independent in this uh, expression. And we can apply Voronoi summation in n1, n2. And now we, are sure we can use our philosophy that uh, by applying Voronoi summation, we save the initial length by uh, square root of the conductor. So for each of them, we save initial length with Q and square root of conductor is square root of C squared at C. So for N1, we save Q by C. For N2, we save Q by C. So together, we save Q by C square, which is the same as Q by L. So that's our saving over here. And uh, with, so with that, we arrive at an expression of this form. And now we bring in the complete sum over A over here inside. And this is a closed Riemann sum. Okay. So, uh, and so once you have a closed Riemann sum, the well bound give, will give you a non-trivial bound. It will give you a square root cancellation over here. So here in this A sum, we expect to save square root of C or QL to the power one quarter, except in a case, for example, when N1 equals to N2, L1 equals to L2, and R equals to zero, then of course, uh, this closed Riemann sum, uh, it's not a closed Riemann sum anymore, and you're not saving anything. Then to settle with the trivial bound over A, okay? So, but when this equality is hold, then here you are saving L in N1 equals to N2, you're saving L because Ni's are of size L, C is of size, and this is Q times L over here. And R, A, A, R equals to zero means you're saving L over here. So you're saving L cube, okay? okay so in total, uh, we are saving Q to the power five quarter by L to the power three quarter. That is this saving times uh, the saving we had before. So that gives you Q to the power five quarter times L to the power three quarter. And uh, this L cube times Q by L, which is Q times L square. Okay, so these are the two savings. And we can choose L optimally by equating uh, this saving with this saving and the optimal choice of L turns out to be Q to the power one by 11. And as you can see that you have actually saved more than what you were required to save. Okay. We are required to save uh, Q times L. Uh, we have saved Q times L square and L. So we have saved L extra and L is of size Q to the power one by 11. So, uh, so it follows that from this that the bound we get is uh, the convexity minus one by 22. So you get a subconvex bound. And a nice application of this subconvexity bound is uh, to show that the rational points on a sphere get equidistributed. Okay, so this is a very nice application. You can look at the literature and uh, read more about it. Um, so now I'm going to give another um, way of proving subconvexity for the same uh, L function. So I'm again looking at the sum over lambda n chi n, n of size q. And uh, now we are not going to do a moment method. We are going to separate the oscillation of lambda 
on the oscillation of chi using circle method directly over here. Okay, but uh, we need to uh, do a little, a little small trick over here. We cannot just uh, separate n and m. We cannot write lambda n chi m and n equals to m uh, because that 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 will still yield uh, a subconvex bound, but it will not be that good. Uh, Instead of that, we introduce an L. So this is some sort of an amplification here too. So here I'm uh, looking at this sum, and here uh, of course this means that this is zero unless m equals to n L. And when m equals to n L, you, uh, if you put n L over here, you get chi n times chi, chi L, and that chi L is cancelled by chi bar L over here, and that gives you a capital L, and that is balanced by one by L. So this sum is actually equal to this. Okay, and now uh, to detect this, we use the delta method. Okay, so uh, so you have a C, and now the C will be the square root of the size of the equation. So here, M is of size QL, N is of size QL, the size of the equation is Q times L. So C is the square root of Q times L. And again, if you trivially estimate this, you get uh, Q squared times L. Okay, so here, the A sum is balanced by one by C, the C sum is balanced by one by capital C, L sum is balanced by one by L. And so the, this is trivially bounded by the length of the N sum times the length of the M sum, which is Q squared times L. Okay. And so again, we have to save QL, which, is, which was the size of the equation, plus a little extra. Okay. Again, uh, so now we have separated N and M. Uh, we can use Voronoi summation formula for the n and the Poisson summation formula for the m. So for again using the philosophy that we had that from both from Voronoi and Poisson we save the initial length by square root of the conductor. So this is the amount we save from Voronoi and this is the amount we save from Poisson. And uh, once we write down explicitly what happens to the character sum over here, it reduces to something like this. Okay, so these are the dual length for the n sum, the dual length for the m sum. Okay, and also in the a sum, you save square root of c, which is q to the bar. Okay, so so far, uh, it, 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 you'll see that we have saved q times square root of l. So remember uh, that we have to save q times l and little extra. We have saved q times square root of l. And, uh, and we have arrived at an expression where we use reciprocity. Okay, so what is reciprocity? It says that E of uh, this is same as E of C bar N by ML times E of minus N by MLC, but N by MLC is a very small fraction and so that can be ignored. So that uh, the expression on the, in the last line in the previous slide is same as this by reciprocity. And here I'm going to apply Cauchy inequality Okay, so I'm going to take the M and C outside and put L and N inside the absolute value. And uh, that gives me this. And then we open the braces. So we consider the expression inside the braces, open the absolute value square. And you arrive at an expression like this and bring the C sum inside. And now apply Poisson summation formula C. Okay, and then again, you're, you get a Klosterman sum by applying Poisson summation. And again, by Poisson summation formula, uh, this is how much you expect to save, right? Again, uh, this is the length of the sum square root of QL. And if you look at uh, the modulus is M times, the length of M times L square, and the length of M is root Q, so, L, so it's root Q times L to the power three by two, so it's modulus. So you take this and divide by square root of the modulus, that's the amount you save, and that turns out to be QL to the power one quarter. Okay, you save this, except in the case again, when N1 L2 equals to N2 L1, where there's no oscillation over here. And so you should settle with the trivial bound. But when this equality happens, then you are basically saving the length of the equation N1 L2 equals to N2 L1, which is L square. Okay, so where do we save L square? Okay, so this is, the, uh, so this is like the off-diagonal saving and this is the diagonal saving. And we optimize L by equating the diagonal of diagonal segment. And that turns out that L has to be taken as Q to the power one nine. Okay, and uh, now, 
So here the diagonal saving is L square. So inside the braces here, we have saved L square. So once we go out, take the square root, that means we have saved L. We have already saved Q root L before, and now L extra. So our saving is uh, Q root L times L, that is root L excess over the initial loss of Q. Okay, so, and now the root L is uh, Q to the power one by 80. Okay, so we get this new bound, that the L function is bounded by Q to the power half minus one by 18 plus epsilon. So it's slightly better than the previous bound, but uh, you, you can really, uh, uh, you can really work on uh, both the approaches and get a better bound, a much superior bound compared to this. And in fact, you can uh, get an analog of the Burgess bound in both the cases, okay? So uh, that was my plan. That I wanted to tell you about uh, the, uh, the summation formulas and tell you about the uh, convexity problem. And I gave two different methods of proving subconvex bounds for a particular L function. And in the upcoming talk, I'm uh, going to show that how this new method of uh, separation of oscillation can be used to prove subconvex bound for higher rank groups. So we'll be uh, looking more closely on L functions of uh, for GLG um, automorphic forms and ranking the convolution for of GL3 and such GL2 form. Okay. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you.